Good morning, First Baptist Church Rockport. We are live this morning, here ready to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ all together in his spirit. We welcome you. We are glad that you've joined us. And we're going to open today with a word of prayer. So would you bow with us as we pray? Our God and our Father, Lord, we come to you today to thank you for your blessings, the good things that you do for us and for being with us when the things don't seem so good, but you love us and care for us and give us peace in those times. We ask you, God, to be with us during this service today. We thank you that we can be here together and that those that are outside that can't be here today can see what is going on. They can hear our pastor. They can get a message from him and a word from you. So I ask that you would bless us, watch over this service today, and be with each one that is, is sick or, or in mental stress or, or worn out because of the things that are going on in this world. God, we pray that you will touch their lives, touch their hearts, and be with them and give them peace. Guide us in everything we do. Be with our pastor as he brings the message this morning that you would give him the words that will touch each heart. And we pray, God, that there would be decisions made because of the message. Guide us through this coming week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I'd like to share with you Galatians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. It, Paul is saying to the Galatians, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's stand together right there where you're at, your house. Let's stand together and let's sing to God be the glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our victory when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. Amen. Great things he has done. Hear these words of Jesus. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Lord, Thomas said, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. Since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. 
For the Lord himself would descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Amen. Let's stand together and let's sing. When the roll is called up yonder. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, it time shall be no more. And the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore. And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Lay before the master till the dawn to set his sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Put your hands together, church. Here we go. I wondered so aimless, life filled with sin. I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Oh, praise the Lord. I saw the light. Oh, I saw the light. I saw the light. No morning darkness, no morning night. Now I'm so happy sorrow and Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Just like a blind man, I wandered along. Worries and fears, I cling for my own. Then like a blind man, that God gave back his sight. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Yeah, I saw the light, I saw the light. No more than darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I was a fool to wander astray. Straight is the gate and narrow the way. Now I have traded the wrong for the right. Oh, praise the Lord. Just a few more weary days in this. 
Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. song we could ever see worthy of all the praise we could ever bring yeah. worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you oh Jesus Jesus the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, oh, we live for you, Lord. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up my eyes. There is 
1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 says, By the grace God has given me, I lay a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it, but each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I'd fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, now I need Sin runs deep, your grace is more, where grace is found, is where you are, where you are, Lord, I am free, holiness is Christ in me, where you are.
And we need you to show us what reality looks like. Help us to know the truth. Help us to embrace what you call truth. Help us to believe, to trust that it will set us free, that it will give us life. Help us to know that you are the truth. We ask, God, that you would reveal yourself during this time and each moment of each day. Call our name so that we can hear and follow you. Show yourself to us. Guide us in the right path. I pray, Father, that you would touch those who are watching. Bring comfort to them and peace this day. Because th these are times that are troubling indeed on a variety of levels. And so, Lord, we need you. That's our confession. The good news is that you are here. So thank you in this way. May your will be done in our lives. And we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you all get away, Eric, would you introduce everybody? Just yeah. 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 Me on the spot there, Scott. All right, at piano is Becky Livingston, playing that nice piano over there. We have Marcy right here, Marcy Peterson right here. And we have Alexa Dick back here, singing alto. Oh, she's singing kind of lead, and y'all's trading off, right? Then we have Chief Tim J. Rowe back there, and Scott Simmons on the guitar, helping me out. And we got Garrett over there, Garrett Dick today. And I'm just happy and, and pumped to have part of my band back. I can't wait till next week to get everybody back to start playing. But right. thank you, Scott. Yeah. Thank you. So we're live. I just wanted to make sure everybody <laughs> knew. And uh, yeah, we're trying a lot of different things and uh, talking to different people, trying to get us back into some form of in-person worship before the end of May. It might be next Sunday or the Sunday after that. There's a lot of things that have to come together, but we're working on it to try to uh, gather in a way that we can worship with as few distractions as possible while also keeping people safe. And so there's a lot of moving parts. Thank you for being patient uh, with us. And I pray that you all are well and safe and all of that. Hey, we're going to continue on in our uh, series of sermons through the Gospel of Luke today. And today we're going to look at two parables that on the surface appear to be about prayer in the 18th chapter of Luke. Underneath the appearance, these parables are really supposed to teach us about God's justice and God's mercy. We learn some things about prayer that's true, but Jesus <coughs> has some specific things that he's teaching us. And if we're going to understand God's justice and mercy, I'm going to need to uh, define some things for you. So when we talk about justice, we are talking about fairness, uh, correct treatment, or equitable distribution of resources, not socialism for crying out loud but taking care of people in a way that honors God. And so biblical justice is all of this and more, all of these kinds of things. Added to this from the Bible is that the, the idea that God's character compels him to defend the righteous and condemn the wicked. That is justice, God's justice. His justice is linked to his mercy. And so when we talk about God's mercy, we're saying that quality of God by which he faithfully keeps his promises and maintains his covenant relationship with his chosen people despite their unworthiness and their unfaithfulness. So God keeps his word. He keeps his promises. God always can be counted on to do what is right and good even when his people are squirrely and don't keep their part and don't do what they say and don't keep their commitment and fall away from the faith. God is always going to do what is right and good regardless of the response of his people, and that is mercy. It means that you and I don't get what we deserve. Instead, we get grace. We get what we don't deserve. In the Bible, the Old Testament prophets lived out and expressed this tension between God's justice and God's mercy. And we see this as well in some of the Psalms. And they would cry out, Oh Lord, how long? How long are the wicked going to prosper? How long am I going to suffer? How long 
is it going to be like this until justice is done and we experience your mercy and we see your justice? And I think it's fair to ask, especially in light of everything that's going on in our country and all over the world, where is God's justice? I mean, we're all still here. He hasn't flooded the world and struck us all dead yet. And that's mercy. But where is God's justice? Can it be seen in the world today? Jesus tells a couple of parables to help us to understand some things about how we are to approach God in light of his justice and his mercy. So look with me in Luke chapter 18. I'm going to start reading in verse 1. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, Even though... I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, listen to what that unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, Have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. There's really two ideas here in two very different parables, but connected by the fact that they are about prayer and by the the, the tension between God's justice and God's mercy. So let's look at these two ideas here that Jesus wants us to understand. First of all, I think we can see that I can confidently plead my case in God in prayer because God is just. I can confidently plead my case to God in prayer because God is just. And this relates to God's justice. Jesus In telling the parable, uses a scene from everyday life. A widow comes to a judge. She seeks justice. This judge is not the nicest guy and doesn't have much compassion and puts her off, but she will not easily be put off, and she persists in seeking justice from this judge. What does Jesus intend for us to get from this parable? Well, I think he's clear in verses 6 through 8 that God is sure to give justice to those who follow Jesus and face suffering and persecution as a result. God is sure to give justice to those who follow Him, who trust Him. They can count on God to make things right. In verse 6, Jesus contrasts the ungodly judge with God Himself. Jesus makes a lesser to greater argument. The judge is unrighteous because of his lack of compassion. And if such an insensitive, uncompassionate character responds to repeated pleas from someone he does not know or care about, how much more so will a righteous 
good and loving God respond to His children? And in verse 7, God's response to us is seen in two rhetorical questions. First of all, Jesus asks, will God not bring justice for His chosen ones? See, God will bring justice in the face of trouble, in the face of hardships, in the face of injustice. God will come to the defense of those He has chosen and called for Himself. The second question is, will God delay forever? And I know some of us are wondering that right now. We believe that God's going to give justice. Where is it? When is it going to come? Is He going to delay forever? And verse 8 answers this question, God will give justice and quickly. Now, I know that God reckons time differently than I do. And what's quick to me is not necessarily quick to the Almighty. But at just the right time, He will keep His word. And it will appear quickly to Him while I have to wait and trust Him. But Jesus is saying, I think, that believers are to keep the faith. They are to keep going. Even when it seems like there's a delay in God making things right and we are suffering injustices and these are difficult circumstances and we might even be suffering, Jesus is saying to keep going. Don't stop. To persist because of Christ. And why would we persist? Because God will make all things right in His own perfect time. He can be trusted. And at just the right time, He will do what He has said, and He will make all things right and all things new. We also see in verses 1 through 5 that those who follow Jesus are to be persistent in seeking justice from God and longing for the completion of God's kingdom. In verse 1, Jesus' point is that the disciples should not stop praying for justice and for the return of Jesus Christ that will bring justice. This is to be the longing of our hearts. We are to go to God with this desire consistently. We are to view the world through this lens. O oh Lord, come quickly and make all things right and make all things new. In verse 3, the widow appears to be in a financial dispute with some kind of adversary. She is helpless. She feels hopeless. She appeals over and over again to someone who has the authority and the power to vindicate her. In verse 5, uh, the judge gives justice to the widow in order to stop her from bothering him. Uh, the widow's persistence brought success. And so in the parable, you have this apparent paradox. God knows and cares about our needs, and He is going to keep His word to us, and yet He seems to expect His people to be persistent in praying about them. What I think Jesus is telling us is that prayer, like all aspects of discipleship, is a partnership involving our will and action rather than a unilateral work of God that overrides our freedom and responsibility. Yes, God is sovereign and He's going to keep His word, but He invites us to participate with Him because He loves us. And He's not going to force Himself on us. And He's not going to force His way on us when it comes to certain things in our relationship with Him, He wants us to seek Him. And He invites us to pray, to seek Him, to lay our burdens and our anxieties and our concerns and our cries for justice before Him on a regular basis because He said He's going to act on those things when the time is right. So believers are to persist in seeking God's justice in a world that appears void of God's justice. His justice is coming He's inviting us to keep seeking. Now, you may not remember Hurricane Harvey. It made landfall on August 25th of 2017. You remember? I understand that by August the 30th, the Texas Attorney General had received 500 complaints of price gouging. And this really makes me mad and I was angry at the time because we were suffering so much and there was so much need and yet there were some who were willing to make a financial profit, an extraordinary profit, off of all of our neediness. Cases of water were being sold for $99. Uh, there were pictures circulating from Best Buy and Best Buy later issued an apology for price gouging. They sold cases of water in Houston for $42. They had to make a public apology for this uh, faux pas. Understand that hotels were quadrupling their rates. 
so that maybe $100 rooms were going for $400 because of the hurricane. Gasoline was selling for $20 a gallon in some parts of Houston. Now, state law is supposed to give us justice when things like this happen. Uh, Each occurrence can incur a fine of up to $20,000, and if price gouging was perpetrated against a senior citizen, that would be a fine of $250,000 for each occurrence. Now, after all of this took place, there were many lawsuits that the Attorney General brought against many corporations here in Texas, and I tell you, it's fuzzy to see how they were resolved, but I know that at least 48 gas stations across, station, across Texas were ordered to pay $166,000 to refund customers because of their crime of price gouging. So at least there was some measure of justice for Texans after this terrible storm that we had to endure. If the state of Texas can get justice for those who are suffering, how much more so will our God get justice for those who trust Him and may have to endure hardship in the meantime? You see what I did there? Like Jesus in the parable, I made a lesser to greater argument. The lesser is the state of Texas, believe it or not. The greater is the Lord. If the state can do this, how much more so will God? And the question I need to ask is, do I persist in taking my case to God because I know that God is just? Am I convinced that I will receive justice from God? And so I need to keep pursuing Him, taking my case to Him because He is listening. And he is good. And he has promised to give justice at just the right time. All right, now let's look at the second parable. Here we see that while I'm to have confidence in God, my confidence is in God's mercy, not in my merits. So here Jesus is going to address the question, what attitude does God look for in those who seek him out? What attitude does God commend? And the answer is humility. And so I don't go to God saying, hey, I deserve justice because, well, I'm righteous. So Jesus is going to address that issue and tell us what attitude we are to bring to God. God's love, as you know, is not earned. It is freely given to those who are conscious of their need of His love and and conscious of their unworthiness. God's love. We see several things in the second parable that Jesus gives us. First, we see that some people believe they deserve God's favor and that others do not. In verse 9, the people that Jesus warns by telling this parable are the self-righteous. These are the people that have a misdirected uh, sense of self-confidence. They think that they're okay and that they are safe in God's presence. They are convinced that they, on their own merits, are acceptable to God and that God gives them everything that they deserve. I've worked hard, I've earned God's favor, and that's exactly what I'm going to get from God, His favor. And so these self-righteous people in the parable are symbolized in the character of the Pharisee. So we see that in verse 10, the Pharisee and the tax, tax collector enter into the presence of God at the temple to pray. The Pharisee is so certain in verse 11 of his righteousness that he compares himself favorably to a variety of sinners. Literally, the man says, I thank you, God, that I'm such a great guy, that I'm not like these other sinners. They're bad people, believe me, Lord. And I'm not like them at all, and I thank you that I'm not like them. He He is so prideful that it permeates the very way he addresses the Almighty there in the temple. And he is so self-righteous that he judges others and condemns them for their unworthiness to be in the presence of God. And in verse 12, he begins to call attention to his own religious activity, which is commendable. He fasts and he tithes. It's as if he thinks that God should be impressed with his record of service. Oh Lord, I sacrificed so much by doing everything you've asked me to do, and now I deserve your favor. 
Next, in verse 13, we see that some recognize the truth about themselves and humbly throw themselves upon God's mercy. So, the character of the tax collector is a complete contrast from the Pharisee. Instead of drawing close to the altar, he remains far off. Uh, The distance suggests his sense of unworthiness to approach God. He doesn't turn his eyes to heaven. He keeps his eyes down and... He beats his breast as a sign of contrition. He asks only for mercy. He confesses only the truth about himself. Lord, have mercy on me, for I am a sinner. He asks God to show mercy through atoning forgiveness. In verse 14, Jesus makes comment on the parable. We see that God justifies and promises to exalt the humble while the proud are unjustified and will be humbled by God. It's an alarming comment that Jesus makes. He endorses the tax collector's attitude, saying that the tax collector goes down from the temple in a state of acceptance. He has a right relationship with God because God does give him mercy. However, The proud Pharisee was not justified, and the implication appears to be that he remained condemned in his sin, having a broken relationship with God that was not made right in spite of all his religious behavior and in spite of his presence there in the temple to pray. Jesus reveals that God vindicates the humble sinner who turns to God's mercy and repentance. God honors humility. Humility is exalted in the parable, while pride, especially religious pride, is condemned. I look around at our culture right now, and I see a lot of people who are experts on everything. I would encourage all of us to remember that we are not in control, but God is. And therefore, our perspectives would do with a little hint of humility from time to time. I read a story of uh, Texas Governor uh, uh, Pat Neff years ago who received an invitation to speak at one of the penitentiaries here in Texas. Um, After speaking, he said that he would wait around afterwards to greet the, the, the inmates who wanted to come up and share with him. They could tell him whatever they wanted him to know and he would keep it in confidence. And so... Uh, One after another, the inmates came and they told him their story. And you can guess what they said. I'm innocent. Everybody, of course, was innocent. They were wrongly convicted. They should not be there. They wanted the governor to pardon them. And so finally, one man came and said, Governor Neff, I do not want to take much of your time. I only want to say that I really did what they convicted me for. But I have been here a number of years. I believe I've paid my debt to society and that if I were to be released, I would be able to live an upright life and show myself worthy of your mercy. Well, out of all the people the governor heard that day, one man was pardoned, and it was the man who demonstrated humility. He was guilty. He even admitted that he was guilty. He deserved to be punished. He deserved to be in prison, but... He acknowledged his crime, he humbled himself, and asked forgiveness of the governor. That is exactly what sinners must do as they approach the Lord God Almighty. He knows our sin. We need to acknowledge that we know our sin, and that we deserve his wrath and punishment. The Bible says that if we will confess our sin and humble ourselves, and ask for forgiveness, that God will be merciful and offer us salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The question I need to ask is, am I placing my confidence in God's mercy or in my own merits? Praise God that I don't get what I deserve. Instead, what I receive through Jesus Christ is mercy and grace and new life. So as I close, I want to invite you 
to persist in how you seek God's kingdom and justice in the world, especially during those times when you are persecuted for your faith. As you follow Christ, the world pushes back against you. You need to stay the course and trust that in His own perfect timing, God is going to make all things right and He's going to make all things new. Are you longing for that day? Does your heart desire for Christ to return and establish His kingdom in righteousness and justice once and forever? Are you ready for Him to make all things right and to make you new? Are you staying the course and pursuing the Lord and His justice? Secondly, today, I want to invite you to humbly throw yourself on God's mercy, to confess your sin, to turn away from your sin, to turn to new life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Depend completely on God's grace today to forgive you of your sin and to give you new life. Accept God's grace through Jesus Christ. You don't have to earn God's favor, but you do have to trust in what Jesus has done for you through His death and resurrection. Are you trusting in Christ today? You can do that today while we pray. Ask Him to forgive you for your sin. Ask Him to come into your life, not just as Savior, but as Lord as well. And then follow Him. Do what He says with each new day. Give Him your life and walk in the path that He has placed before you. Let's pray together. Lord, we want to thank You that You are a God who keeps His promises, and that You promised, Lord, for those who trust You, for those who follow You, for those who stay with You right to the end, that a time is coming when all the universe will know that they were right. So Lord, help us to stay the course no matter what we are enduring so that on that day we and everybody will know that we were right to trust you. You will give justice to those who place their faith in Jesus Christ. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Make all things right and make all things new. Until that day, Lord, we humbly come before you confessing our sin. We feel all kinds of things right now. We are experiencing all kinds of things. And there are many threats and uh, sources of fear and anxiety in our world. Lord, sometimes we have a skewed perspective on uh, our relationship with you. And we think maybe you owe us something. And then sometimes we think perhaps you've let us down when we don't get what we want. Instead, Lord, remind us that all is grace. We don't get what we deserve. In Jesus Christ, we get what we don't deserve. So today, I and may all of us confess our sin. Help us to turn away from it, to turn to Christ for salvation, and to experience your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. May your will be done in the lives of all of those who are watching. We trust you, Lord. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, church, as we go out this week, let's keep our mind on what Christ has done for us and how he has saved us from our sin. Let's celebrate with I Saw the Light. I saw the light, I saw the light, no more darkness.
have a good week.